Thank you, Dean Walker. And I reiterate uh, the Dean's welcome to everyone, especially Dr. Mandy McMichael. Dr. Mandy McMichael is the Associate Director and J. David Slover Assistant Professor of Ministry Guidance at Baylor University, a role which offers her the opportunity to work with undergraduate students who are discerning a call to ministry. Her first book, Miss America's God, Faith and Identity in America's Oldest Pageant, was published by Baylor University Press in 2019. Her next book, a co-authored work with New Testament scholar Dr. Alicia Myers, explores Helen Barrett Montgomery's perspectives on womanhood in Victorian America, paying special attention to how they influence her views of women in the Bible. Helen Barrett Montgomery's Bible, Victorian American and Competing Constructions of Womanhood, will be published by Oxford University Press in 2024, the 100th anniversary of Montgomery's translation of the New Testament. Her current research project, An Oral History of Baptist Women in Ministry, grew out of conversations and interactions with her female students wrestling with a call to ministry. This collection will provide insight into the gendered nature of call, even as it offers encouragement to women who feel isolated and alone in pursuing their calling. To date, Dr. McMichael has interviewed over 60 Baptist women in ministry with plans to build to 75 by the end of May. Dr. McMichael is an active member of several professional societies, including the National Association of Baptist Professors of Religion, which she serves as president. She is also an ordained minister in the Baptist tradition who has served in a variety of ministry roles. Dr. McMichael and her husband, Chad, Egg Chad Eggleston, have two children. So her secondary job is as a taxi driver for their numerous activities. The McEggs are active members of Calvary Baptist Church in Waco, Texas. Welcome, Dr. McMichael. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Good evening. What a privilege it is to be with you at Wake Forest Divinity School. Today has been a wonderful day um, of delightful people and gracious hospitality, so thanks so much for having me. I'm honored to be kicking off this lecture series, What Kind of Baptist? The Importance of Public Witness in a Secular Age. But first, you should know I'm a historian, as has already been mentioned, and so I do promise some thoughts from the preacher side of me about um, what it means to offer public witness in this particular cultural moment, but we're going to dive back 100 years first, uh, because that's what historians do. We seek to learn from the past and to illuminate the voices of those who've come before and the examples that we might glean from them. So hopefully I can channel the great Baptist historian, Dr. Bill Leonard, to be dazzling in my recitation of history so that no one will fall asleep on me. That's, that's the goal anyway. The room grew silent as Helen Barrett Montgomery mounted the podium to give her presidential address to the Northern Baptist Convention in 1922. She urged her fellow Baptists to find ways to work together in spite of doctrinal differences concluding with a flourish. Brethren, we are in a great campaign. We have a war to fight for our Lord Jesus. We must not disagree. We must not fight each other. We must unite to win. Montgomery's words uttered during the critical fundamentalist modernist controversy of the 1920s represent only part of Mac Montgomery's pragmatic effort to circumvent the impasse and hold the denomination together. She worked diligently to avoid the polarization of Northern Baptist, advocating an inclusive position that would allow for continued cooperative efforts in local churches and associations throughout the world. But her appeal to missions at these, as the ultimate goal of Christian association is more than a theor theoretical position between the competing poles of fundamentalism and modernism. Montgomery's vision of evangelistic practice is a call to make something more, more, something more than doctrine central to Christian discourse. She was not saying that doctrine was unimportant, but she sidelined theological debates as less important than the shared work they were called to do. 
This was the same cooperative attitude that aided her earlier work in the ecumenical women's missions movement, her commitment to civic reform, and her eventual translation of the New Testament. Montgomery knew that little could be gained from fighting against each other as Christians. Cooperation was needed to fight for our Lord Jesus in the world. The world needed their collective public witness. The mediating pragmatism that was championed by Montgomery was one frequently occupied by women intent on finding or creating space to use their gifts in the world. Montgomery's responses to opportunity, conflict, inclusion, and exclusion provide a window into the gendered world she and other women navigated. Her life and ministry offer evidence of the many resourceful ways that women entered and succeeded in places that they were not always invited or welcome. They also, however, depict complex views not only about faith, but about race and class and gender, all of which influenced Montgomery's understanding of scripture. Hers is a life worthy of examination, especially when we imagine what it might mean to offer a public Christian witness in an increasingly secular age. Her pragmatic approach was not necessarily a middle way, but a way through polarized discourse. And it helps us imagine fresh ways to engage a, pol um, a polarized public with the good news of Jesus Christ. Dr. Alicia Myers, who is actually here, uh, is New Testament professor at Campbell University Divinity School and I are working on this book project to imagine and work through some of the gendered nature um, and how it influences uh, Helen Barrett Montgomery's translation paying particular attention to how they influence her views of women in the Bible and by extension the world. Montgomery's work shows us a lot about her world, but also our own as readers and interpreters of the Bible continue to construct and define biblical womanhood. And undoubtedly that work on gender and its influence in her life will impact tonight's lecture. But for tonight, I really wanna shift the lens just a bit to consider more her Baptist identity uh, as a, a woman, yes, but I want to focus on the Baptist part of that. More specifically, I want us to consider how Montgomery's self-proclaimed identity as a, quote, stiff little Baptist contributed to and influenced her commitment to cooperation. Her life groomed her for pragmatic leadership from her Baptist upbringing to her education in an ecumenical space, which suggests that a spirit of cooperation can actually be cultivated. It's something we can learn how to do. So from the examples that we draw from Montgomery's life, I will hope to, I will, propose a few things that we might do as ministers and theological educators to engender the same courage of conviction and ger generosity of spirit in the next generation of Baptist Christian leaders. Just as Montgomery's witness was needed to ensure rights for women, education reform, accessible translation of scripture, so too are our voices and commitment to partnership needed in the polarized political sphere in which we find ourselves. The world needs Baptists who are willing to cooperate. Before turning to Montgomery's public witness, however, it is crucial to consider a few moments in her early life that solidified her identity as an educator, a Baptist, and a member of a global Christian faith. Examining her earliest years reveals a precocious, stubborn child deeply influenced by her church and family. When one finds a spirit of compromise and pragmatism that foreshadows her later leadership style. She was the eldest of three children and she came from a long line of Baptists. Her father, Adoniram Judson Barrett, was named in honor of the pioneering Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson, and he played a key role in her spiritual and educational formation. Judson, passed on, Judson Barrett passed on his love of learning to his children. And so from an early age, Montgomery learned the joy of education as her father taught her and made education available to her. Uh, as a woman growing up in the 19th century, this was not a guarantee. Um, the central role played by education in Montgomery's upbringing was rivaled only by her formation in the church. So Montgomery joined Lake Avenue Baptist Church in Rochester, New York at 15, and she was baptized by her father, who was the pastor. She refused to take her commitment lightly, and she recorded that from that day onwards, the church became one of my reasons for existence. But her memories of this moment that should have been only joy-filled were not all rosy. She writes about this moment, 
One cloud darkens the remembrance of that moving experience. Candidates came before the deacons to be questioned as to their Christian experience, and one old deacon put it to me this way, put to me this unfailing inquiry. My young sister, did you feel the burden of sin roll away? Those were his exact words to me, a child of 15 growing up in a Christian home. Trembling, I answered, yes, sir, and realized at once that I had told a lie in order to get into the church. <laughs> her vivid remembrance of the bitterness that engulfed her, even as a gracious father was welcoming her into the church, never left her. For the rest of her life, she lived with this tension between what she believed and what other people expected her to believe. Attention that perhaps compelled her to view Christianity beyond the lens of belief and simple doctrinal assent. And it also influenced her deep acceptance of the Baptist belief that each individual could interpret scripture for herself. So after studying at home and at Livingston Park Seminary, she began Wellesley at the age of 19. Living in community with other Christians there who were not Baptist, taught her the value of working toward common goals despite theologi differing theological positions. She confronted head-on the distinctiveness of her denominational identity. And she kind of struggled to find her way among the Episcopalians and Congregationalists and Presbyterians, even as she lived alongside them. As Dr. Lacey Warner noted, this effort to live in harmony with other Christians helped to cultivate Montgomery's sensitivity to difference as well as skills for building community. It was in living in community that she developed the skills that she needed to participate in a broader community. Montgomery narrated many of these experiences in her letters to her parents, describing how her feelings and struggles as she adapted to her new environment. In one letter, she recounted a particularly jarring moment as a, quote, strict little Baptist, her term, not mine, but I love it. She practiced close communion, walking to a nearby town to take communion in the local congregation instead of receiving it in the chapel services on campus. But on one occasion, there was a diphtheria epidemic in the neighboring town, and she could not go um, for her normal communion. So Montgomery and the other Baptists faced a dilemma. And here's her description as she's writing in the letter. After Dr. Abbott's sermon, he said that the sacrament here was less a church than a family ordinance. In fact, as Christ gave it, he invited to the table all who loved the name of Christ, whether having openly professed it or not. Then he invited all who did not care to partake to remain, and I wanted to, but all the Baptist girls went out, so did, so did we. I could never go through this again. Ought we to have communed? Is it not carrying the point too far when we can't go elsewhere to refrain from communing outwardly as well as in heart? So this, this tension that she felt as she wrestled with, should I take communion here or not take communion here? It kind of mirrored her frustration over her response to the deacon's question when she was joining the church. She said she felt strangely saddened and confused or sadly shaken and confused. As she noted in a letter to her parents, generally, outside, in the world, I can hold firmly to the principle, but here all things seem changed. For four years, we all work together with no thought of sect except at the communion table when I'm shut out from all the other Christians. You cannot understand how it seems. I never should have unless I had been here. So we can see evidence, even as she's a college student, that she's wrestling with how to engage with other Christians in worship. She still held doctrine in high regard, but this lack of doctrinal purity was not what she mourned. She lamented the lack of community with her fellow Christians, being shut out from being in relationship with them in this sacred moment. She found it harder to dismiss her friend's convictions in relationship than it was to denounce differing theological ideals in the abstract. Funny how that works, right? So eventually, Montgomery prioritized relationships with her fellow students over doctrinal divisions. Still, she held tightly to con the convictions of her youth. She did not cease to be Baptist. She did not renounce her Baptist identity. She usually received communion in the local Baptist church. She defended 
baptism by immersion. She convinced one of her roommates, or convinced her roommate, to read the Baptist Covenant and Articles of Faith. So she sounds as exciting as I was as a college student. Um, true story. I contemplated adding a math minor um, when my senior year just for fun. I mean, I'm sure some of you have similar stories of like how wonderfully well adjusted you were as uh, college students too. Um, but Montgomery's interaction with Christians outside the Baptist tradition stretched and strengthened her Baptist identity. There was not a threat but rather it was something that helped solidify it for her. She stretched by reconsidering her theology of close communion when it was impossible for her to go elsewhere. She stretched by widening her definition of worship even. For example, on one occasion, she accepted an invitation to hear the creation by Handel and Hayden Society of Boston instead of going to church. She wrote, I'm almost afraid to confess what I did on Sunday. No, I'm not either, for I did what seemed best. <laughs> I had kind of a mean feeling, and so did Florence, but the music, I can't tell you how grand it was. I shall never forget it so long as I live. And it was appropriate for Sunday. Her Baptist faith allowed for this flexibility. More specifically, Montgomery's time at Wellesley reinforced her belief in the ability of the individual to interpret scripture and for God to speak to her through the Bible read or proclaimed or even sung. This practice of stretching and strengthening proved vital to her later ministry of reconciliation among Northern Baptists. Her leadership among the women's ecumenical missions movement and in her work that she did in education and social reform. But it was not the only useful skill that she picked up while she was at Wellesley. Greek preparation enabled her to produce an English translation of the New Testament. Rhetoric training prepared her for a life of public speaking. One year, I think she did almost 200 speeches as she traveled the world raising money, or traveled in the country raising money. Less obvious are the tools she received from various relationships at Wellesley. She polished the art of negotiation and cooperation with her classmates. Her instructors reinforced a deep belief that women could and should have an increasing role in society. She left Wellesley ready to go change the world. Chapel speakers and spiritual leaders passed on this sense of in a vocation to go and enact change, to be a public witness. And in fact, Montgomery expressed her bewilderment in trying to decide which way to turn my attention, lamenting that she could not divide myself out, up and do work in every direction at once. And throughout her life, she stayed true to this desire to minister in every direction, even if she didn't do it all at once. Unlike some Baptists, Montgomery's Baptist identity did not proclaim did not um, preclude civic and ecumenical work, it drove it. Prized Baptist distinctives such as religious freedom, the priesthood of all believers, informed her understanding of the diversity of Christian belief and witness, making her a willing partner in ecumenical dialogue and reform work. And her deeply held convictions regarding the importance of education, scripture, and missions informed how she lived her life in the world. Montgomery's Baptist identity was not threatened by working with non-Baptist. Rather, her deeply rooted Baptist identity meant that she was secure in her convictions, one of which was to cooperate with others, especially other Christians, to witness for God in the world. So in her early years after she left Wellesley, Montgomery worked as a teacher before getting married. And then in 1893, she, she was elected president of the Women's Educational and Industrial Union, a group that Susan, Susan B. Anthony helped to organize that advocated for the needs of women. So among other things, the, the group founded a legal aid office. It set up public playgrounds. It advocated for free kindergartens. Montgomery held leadership positions in this organization and in several others that advocated for the rights of women. And with Susan B. Anthony, helped raise funds to make the University of Rochester co-educational. In 1899, 1899, 20 years before women were allowed to vote, Helen Barrett Montgomery was elected to the school board in Rochester. She was the first female elected and she served in that position for 10 years. She was active obviously an active member of her community who believed in the importance of social reform and the duty of Christians to participate in it. This was, it was not an option to just withdraw and remain in your, your closed sphere. Christians believe, she believed that Christians had an obligation to be out in the world making a difference. She cooperated to enact change in her beloved Rochester speaking, fundraising, writing, and more. 
as the situation demanded it. But her vision for cooperation was not just local. As a leader in the ecumenical mis women's missions movement, Montgomery wrote multiple textbooks for the Central Committee on the United Study of Foreign Missions. That is such a long title. CCUSFM, even the acronym is super long. Uh, and she undertook this speaking tour that I mentioned earlier during 1910 and 1911, where she delivered close to 200 speeches to raise money for missions. She also visited multiple sites of international missions before publishing The King's Highway in 1915, a book which sold over 160,000 copies. Oh, to sell 1% of that. Um, 160,000 copies. Um, if Helen Barrett Montgomery's ecumenical vision was ignited at Wellesley, it took flight in the women's missionary movement. As her associate and traveling companion, Lucy Peabody, put it, the church of her parents was hers by choice. But I cannot find the least evidence that her faith limited her outlook on the landscape of civilization. On the contrary, she was enabled by her beliefs to rise above the frontiers of race and nationality and religion and tradition and survey the world as a whole. Her books for the Central Committee outlined a pragmatic model of missions and the importance of interdenominational cooperation. For example, in The King's Highway, 160 thousand copies of it. Uh, Montgomery chronicled the activity of women throughout the world, emphasizing the importance of women, women's education to the, spread of to the spread of Christianity. So as she discussed her focus on evangeliz evangelization specifically of women, she noted, when you reach a man, you gain an individual. When you Christianize a girl, you gain a household. As, Alicia, as Dr. Myers has rightly pointed out, the gender constructs in this statement seem to indicate that Montgomery sees women as more capable of changing the world than men, at least in a way. She saw that it was women who had the, the time and the space and the desire to educate others. And so in educating them, you gain a family, you gain a community. Thus, Montgomery advocated at home and abroad for women to have access to education. For her, missions included not just evangelism, but providing social services like education and health care. Um, they weren't, now I will, I will hasten to say, they were a means to an end for her. This is about saving souls. This is the 19th, early 20th century, right? But they, she saw them as important and that they could not be divorced from one another. You could not have one without the other. They went hand in hand. Um, during the same time, she remained actively involved in the mission work of her own denomination, where she served as president of the Women's American Baptist Foreign Mission Society for t from 1914 to 1924. She published denominational pieces. She provided a jubilee gift of $450,000 in 1921 to the Northern Baptist Convention. And she resolved to be involved in her local church and community, her denomination, and the broader Christian fellowship of believers. It was not an either or for her. Everything went together to help her understand what it meant to be a public witness. Her success in the missions movement set the stage for her to become the first female president of the Northern Baptist Convention in 1921. She was also, as it turns out, the first woman to be elected president of any denominational body um, of this size in the United States. And it was her experience as a civic reformer. I mean, she worked with Susan B. Anthony, right? She's kind of her successor in a lot of ways in there in Rochester, an educator, a missions advocate. And those things gave her the tools to like maintain denominational unity in a time when lots of other denominations were fracturing over this fundamentalist modernist controversy. So this example is relevant to our conversation together tonight because one of Montgomery's primary motivations for promoting unity within her denomination was because she did not want to weaken the denomination's public witness. Um, so we're, gonna, we're getting to that, I promise. We're getting to the payoff. But as we've already noted, Montgomery was well-versed in the art of constructive dialogue and practiced at convincing people of the importance of working toward a common goal. So she used her, president as, she used her position as president of the NBC to try to broker peace between the opposing parties. She wrote letters, like trying to propose compromise. Let me give you space to meet at the National Convention so we can avoid this schism. But her initial efforts failed to produce the results she wanted as fundamentalists refused to give up any ground, something that might be familiar to some of you. 
And so as a result, Montgomery changed tactics because she saw no way to save the denomination except to, quote, do battle and defeat them, them being the fundamentalists. Thus, despite her commitment to cooperation, she was not afraid of a fight if fight was needed. And she knew that a fight in this case was the most productive way forward. So she continued to collaborate and strategize with non-fundamentalist conservatives and with modernists right on up to the convention, but she stopped wasting her time negotiating with the fundamentalists who were unwilling to compromise. And so as hinted in the introduction, this kind of comes to a culminating moment in her presidential address. She has the room, she has their collective attention, and this is her moment to see if she can hold it all together. So in this um, speech, she's, she is employing her um, listeners to draw on their resources of spiritual power and lay aside childish things and try to move forward together. So in this bold characterization of the debates, she doubtlessly gained the delegates' attention, most of whom, of course, were men. She then appealed to their denominational heritage, democratic sensibilities, and Christian duty in her effort to promote unity moving strategically to deflate the positions of both the fundamentalist and the modernist without naming names or taking sides. She pre presents a compelling plea to Northern Baptists and asks them to find some common ground. Fundamentalists and modernists could accomplish more together for God's kingdom together than apart. So in the first half of her speech, she addressed some of the difficulties of the present denominational situation. She challenged listeners to remember that their history of individual liberty was about civil religious liberty and religious and liberty. She noted the democratic nature and principles of Baptists, stating, we regard the right to cooperate as equally sacred as the right to differ. So like, why do we need to have a, a statement of faith? Like, we, we already know that we can agree or disagree. That's part of what it means to be Baptist. And so, these Baptist principles had practical Im implications for the controversy at hand. Um, the most controversial issue was that the fundamentalists were trying to get the convention to adopt a statement of faith. Yes, this happens everywhere, all the time. Um, we haven't learned our lesson yet. But Montgomery undercut this notion, reminding delegates that a statement could be voluntarily adopted by convention churches. But the Baptist belief in the autonomy of the local church prevented the convention from forcing a statement on its members. So formulating a statement of faith for the NBC to adopt would comparisonly near to abandoning one of our fundamental principles. And so she deftly draws on her Baptist identity to really to outmaneuver them, right? And to protect against schism. She re-emphasized the notion that practicing evangelism would speak louder than adopting a, a doctrinal statement, proclaiming, if we cannot learn to subordinate voluntary personal views and preferences to the decision of the majority, then the outlook of our Christian democracy is dark indeed. So she implored the denomination to stop scrapping organizations and start conserving by supporting their denominational leaders, emphasizing education and adopting an inclusive position. And, this, and then she gets to the so what. She concluded her speech with a call to political action. And this is what matters most for us tonight. The civic questions to which she turned were international peace, the enforcement of the 18th Amendment prohibition. That's probably less, you know, a, a motivating factor today. Um, and industrial relations. Now is not the time for the church to turn inward. For Montgomery, the church possessed an obligation to interact in society because it could offer something that mere social programs could not. As she so eloquently stated, we must believe that the power to put away war lives in that living faith that has destroyed slavery and given a death, death blow to the liquor traffic. In short, she believed that the Christian message possessed a liberating message that was not found in aid efforts alone. The Christian witness was needed in the public sphere. So she called on them to meet war propaganda with anti-war education, to work to maintain prohibition and work to improve industrial relationships. Could the denomination not just bury our prejudices and bring out our conviction? The delegates of 1922 proved sympathetic to her message and by Vote of 1264 to 
637, they adopted an inclusive policy rather than the more doctrinally based confession proposed by fundamentalists. Montgomery's year of tireless efforts and a lifetime of preparation resulted in the much desired unity of her beloved denomination, at least until the year before she died, and then they did end up splitting. But that was, you know, a good decade later. So even on her presidential address to the Northern Baptists, Montgomery could not resist the urge to push them beyond internal politics to consider their public witness. And to think more specifically and strategically about kingdom matters, missions, peace, prohibition, education, fair labor practices, these were the things that they could agree on. Why not focus their energy there? It was not enough for Christians to remain in their churches debating with each other. The world stood in what Christians, including Baptists, had to offer, and more could be accomplished if they worked together. This commitment to pragmatic reasons just defined Montgomery's life and work, as I have illustrated for us tonight. But it was also born out of her conviction that being a public witness was not optional for Christians. Scripture demanded it. Christians were meant to witness to hope and light in a dark, hurting world. And going into the world to witness for Christ was not merely about securing conversions. It was about carrying hope and help to those who needed it. Christian engagement in the world provided a public witness to a different way of living, one which cared about the good of all. Of course, the United States in which we currently find ourselves is far more secular than the one Montgomery inhabited 100 years ago. And for the most part, most of us, are far less evangelistic than she was in her approach. And yet, in many ways, we're still living in the aftermath of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, the same debates about how we interpret scripture and which pieces of Baptist identity get privileged in debates remain resounding all around us. So for those of us attempting to educate or become the next generation of church leaders, I think Helen Barrett Montgomery offers us a model for public witness and engagement. First, Helen Barrett Montgomery was secure in her faith identity, but open to the faith expressions of others. Her identity as a stiff little Baptist was initiated in her family of origin, and it was nurtured and solidified in an ecumenical environment where she tested her beliefs against scripture and in community with other Christians. It was the autonomy of her faith that made her more open to ecumenical community and gave her a way to incorporate her experiences instead of just relying on her knowledge of doctrine. So too can we and our students examine and define faith in conversation with one another. Montgomery debated her classmates, listened to Christian speakers, made them read articles of faith, and and she never shied away from trying out new ideas. They were not something that were scary. It was a gift. Education was a gift. So our faith, like Montgomery's, can be stretched and strengthened through our own education, including the education that comes when we encounter difference and listen to the witness of others. When Montgomery encountered her classmates' faith through shared life rather than the abstract, it broadened her worldview and helped her see possibilities for partnership. So I, I... find it crucial to provide such opportunities for students in the safety of our classrooms and and churches. Understanding our own faith identity, whatever that might be, and learning to listen across difference is crucial. They're crucial skills for us to cultivate in order to engage in public witness. They help us become more credible witnesses. Second, educating ourselves and others on the issues is also important. Imagine, if you will, that a student comes to class who didn't prepare. It wasn't you, so you have to imagine someone else. They did not read the materials or complete the homework. They forgot to bring the lecture outline or a paper or a pen or a laptop, but they are excited. They are so ready to participate. They feel called to be there and want to make a difference. And they constantly interrupt the prepared students to offer their thoughts. They reference none of the material and indeed are getting crucial facts wrong. (laughs) I think you know where I'm going with this. It does not matter how enthusiastic that student or that person is about the course. There's a limit to what he or she can contribute to the conversation. 
The same is true of our engagement in the public sphere. If we do not educate ourselves on the issues, education, immigration, health care, fill in the blank, we will not be effective as public witnesses, and we may even do a lot of damage. Montgomery traveled the world gathering information before she wrote her book about, about women's education and its importance. She sat in on school board meetings to hear the issues that we're facing, the, her local community in Rochester. And so too should we take the time to educate ourselves. And if we don't have time to learn all the things, because really, who does? Who have time to learn all the things? Defer to the experts. Don't assume it's your job to come in and fix everything. Sometimes our job is to show up and listen and do the work that we're asked to do. To imagine that, that it is, that it is our job, can hurt our Christian witness in the world. Montgomery's example reminds us to know ourselves and to take time to study the issues on which we want to speak and act, because only then should we engage the public sphere. Third, cooperate when possible and pivot when necessary. Helen Barrett Montgomery's instinct was to cooperate. She wanted, she didn't want um, conflict. She didn't invite fight. She wanted to work with others. She saw that that was a, a goal from her that she saw kind of advocated for in scripture. But she did not let her desire for collaboration hamstring her. When she knew the thing that needed to be done, she was willing to fight. So when the fundamentalist in the Northern Baptist Convention refused to play ball, she didn't keep trying to kick the football like Charlie Brown style, right? She realized that the football was not going to be there for her, and she took another, another tactic. She found another way to convince the Baptists, or at least enough of them, that the importance of their collective witness was really what mattered the most. This point, to cooperate whenever possible, seems like a really small thing to name as a distinctive or something to be modeled until we remember how few people actually are willing to do it. Far too many of us choose to walk away and start our own thing at the, even the slightest hint of disagreement because disagreement and trying to be in conversation is hard. But striving to cooperate is, I think, one of Montgomery's most helpful strategies for public engagement and also the hardest one to follow. Fourth, Montgomery's witness reminds us that when you fight, you should fight towards an end. Arguing just for the sake of argument is not useful, but when both parties are, come to the conversation with willing, as willing partners, minds can be changed. Montgomery put it this way, it may be wrong, but I do love an argument. I just feel in my element. I sniff the battle from afar, but I've come round to Papa's view that argument simply as argument seldom does any good unless both parties are anxious to learn something and are in a good mood to accept truth wherever they find it. Argument only strengthens the prejudices of both sides. So if you're going to fight, if you're going to engage in argument, do it towards an end. Montgomery knew probably from experience that not everybody was going to participate in conversations in good faith. So when that is the case, it is important not to waste time and energy going round and round with those who won't work with you. In other words, some things are worth the fight. You just have to learn which things those are for you. Finally, never stop nurturing your faith. Helen Barrett Montgomery's life was steeped in prayer, in worship, in Bible study. She believed in the power of prayer to affect change and even called on the denomination to have a day of prayer for the work that needed to be done. Her faith drove everything else. So for Montgomery, her public witness was an outgrowth of her personal faith. I think this might maybe be my least popular suggestion, but I contend that it's crucial. We must nurture our faith through the study of scripture, worship with other believers, and with prayer. Personal piety can be a tricky thing for those of us who consider ourselves progressive Baptists. Mm -hmm. Many of us have some church hurt related to legalistic ideas of how our faith should be lived out that can make it really hard for us to re-engage scripture and prayer in devotional ways. We want distance from it so because we're afraid it might hurt us in those same ways. We are ready to engage the, the fight for justice in the world, to advocate for reconciliation, stand against oppression, meet needs with compassion, 
and we should. But those actions should be rooted in something beyond our individual desire to do good and feel good about it. Those actions should be the outgrowth of the Christian faith that convicts and compels us to work on behalf of the least of these in the world. We should be able to articulate why. To be a witness, a public witness, is to point to something, to someone beyond ourselves. I do not agree with Montgomery on all things. You can read the book if you want to know more. But I deeply admire her commitment to nurturing her faith and community. She was, she was and knew that she was part of something bigger than herself. And we are part of something bigger than ourselves. So be secure in your faith identity, but open to the identity of others. Educate yourself and others. Cooperate when possible, pivot when necessary. When you fight, fight towards an end and never stop nurturing your faith. Just yesterday, Diana Butler Bass posted a piece titled Congress and the, Religious, the Religion Imbalance on her Substack. If you haven't read it, I commend it to you. It is, among other things, a stirring argument for the importance of, public, of Christian, Christian witness in the public square. And in her discussion of the Speaker of the House election, she notes, many of the upcoming issues facing Congress in the next two years will involve faith and, and ethics, immigration, budgets, education, human and civil rights. All of these concerns are threaded with religious perspectives, theological beliefs, and moral choices shaped by faith. Our Christian witness is needed in this cultural moment. But as Montgomery's example demonstrate and by Butler Bass's article suggests, our faith is rooted in community, education, and cooperation that can help us to do it well. Churches need to teach their history. They need to offer models for engaging the public sphere that are not divisive. It must happen in relationship, and perhaps it is best to start locally with the people we know and build from there. I'm not going to read the whole article to you, though I really wanted to. <laughs> but near the end, Butler Brass writes, in recent years, some Christians have worked on the two Ds, decolonization and deconstruction. I'd like to add a third. We Christians need to de-radicalize our own churches to make things like white Christian nationalism anathema. Ignoring religion and politics won't spare us from divisions, anger, and pain. Ignoring them ensures that even more extremist and dangerous forms of Christian politics will arise to the detriment not only of American politics, but to Christianity itself. We need Christian witness, if nothing else, to testify against what is not that is already happening in the, what is not Christian that is already happening in the public sphere. I think she's right. Just as Montgomery was right when she reminded Northern Baptists that their doctrinal squabbles would hinder their collective work in the world. We cannot hide in our little bubbles because we are engaged. We are called to engage the world. Montgomery once wrote, I know enough things now to make me a saint if I live them. And her life provides evidence that she did indeed try to live them. We know enough things now to be a saint if we live them. The public witness that we are called to could and or can and should point others to Christ. Montgomery knew and accepted that there were limits to cooperation. It was not the answer in every situation, just as it's not for us. And in those cases, she modeled the public witness of Baptists before and after her to fight for justice in the world. Montgomery may have been a stiff little Baptist, but what she learned is that one could bend quite a lot in one's identity without breaking. Such flexibility enabled her to cooperate across the aisle in her denomination as well as beyond it. By holding fast to what she believed was true and important, Montgomery modeled that absolute agreement is not necessary to shared vision and public witness. So what kind of Baptist? I strive to be a Helen Barrett Montgomery Baptist, committed to cooperation, but willing to fight. Thank you.